International Day of Struggle Against uh, <clears throat> Why is this particular day, International Day of Struggle Against Monoculture and Tree Plantations? This, this uh, International Day is a day for organizations, networks, and movement to celebrate resistance and raise awareness and voices to demand stop the expansion of monocultural tree plantations. This plantation threatened the sovereignty and communities and, for, and, and also for indigenous people. And indeed, it's important that we listen to it so we see and we learn more why this particular international day. And we know very well that every hectare of commercial tree plantation is a hectare that, can, uh, that won't be restored uh, to its original ecosystem. And we, of course, lose a lot of biodiversity at the same time or use to grow food in a sustainable way. Every monoculture plantation project is therefore a choice to prioritize profit over climate mitigation and uh, potential biodiversity conservation and food. On the International Day of Struggle against the monoculture tree plantation, we are launching new case studies, as Corina had just mentioned, uh, that shed lights to they shed light on two closely linked tree plantation expansion threats, landscapes restoration in Africa through the food, the African uh, Forest Landscape Restoration Initiative, AFRI uh, 100, and the Green Climate Fund backed Aboro uh, Fund project in Latin America and Africa. And uh, to look at the, what uh, the African Forest uh, Landscape uh, Plantation, its objective was actually meant to is uh, a country led uh, uh, effort to restore 100 million hectares of def uh, deforestation and degradation landscape across Africa by 2030. Africa 100 will, uh, will uh, accelerate the restoration to enhance food uh, security, increase climate change resilience and mitigate uh, and combat rural poverty. So with the case studies today, we might actually try to see is that true? Is that what uh, really happened? Or are there challenges in between? And if they are, what can be done and what can be, you know, uh, be able to uh, look at it? And we'll also look at the link to the, uh, to these are the uh, Arboro uh, uh, funds, plans to expand plantations. And this is kind of worrying for many, if at all the expansions will continue. Today in our, in our uh, webinar, we have five panelists. First, we'll have Oliver Munion from Forest Coalition Portugal, and then we'll have uh, Elvis Opang Meza from uh, Ghana, and then later we'll have Daniel Ribeiro, and then we'll have uh, from uh, Moz uh, Mozambique, and then we'll have Aluz uh, Stang from uh, uh, Biofuel Watch, Almuth, and then lastly we'll have Omar uh, Yampi Center for um, for uh, Studies in Pocho in Paraguay. So let's move on to without wasting a lot of time, you have 10 minutes each, and I will uh, now go to Oliver. Please, uh, um, Oliver, you have the... Thank you very much, Lucy. Um, hi, everybody. Um, good to be with you today. Uh, yeah, as Lucy said, my, my name is Oliver Munyan. Uh, I work for the Global Forest Coalition, uh, and I'm based in Portugal. Uh, I'll just share my screen, there we go. Uh, yeah, Portugal actually has the highest proportion of eucalyptus plantations uh, by area, uh, proportionally by area anywhere in the world. Uh, so this uh, issue is very important to me. Um, first of all, I'm just going to give you a quick uh, overview of uh, the work that we've been doing recently. Um, so we've been focusing on uh, German climate finance. Um, so this work supported by the Heinrich Böll Foundation. Uh, and bread for the world as well. Uh, basically, the, the people behind the germanclimatefinance.de website. Uh, so we've been looking at uh, the multilateral level, so the sort of big international scale, uh, and where money that uh, the German government, mostly through the BMZ, which is the Federal, Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, uh, where its climate finance is going and how it's being used uh, and where and if there are links to uh, commercial tree plantations. Uh, so yeah, as, as Lucy was already explaining, uh, today we're looking at uh, the Bond Challenge and AFR 100 in particular, uh, and also the Green Climate Fund. Uh, so this is just to give you an overview of uh, where all the case studies and presentations that we're going to hear today fit together. So first of all, looking at the Bond Challenge, uh, this was launched by the German government in 2011 and aims to restore 
350 million hectares of land by 2030. Uh, there are four regional initiatives that contribute to the Bond Challenge. One of them is AFR 100, which is the Africa Forest Landscape Restoration Initiative. Uh, that was launched in 2015 at the Paris Climate Talks and aims to restore 100 million hectares uh, of uh, degraded forest landscapes uh, by 2030. So far, 30 African countries have uh, signed up to AFR 100 uh, and made pledges. Uh, and in total, I think they've now exceeded the uh, target by about 25 million hectares. So to look at uh, AFR 100, um, we've, we've got three case studies in the briefing that we've published today. Um, that we'll hear more about from the other speakers. So first of all, we'll look at Portocell Mozambique. Uh, Portocell is a plantation company uh, uh, that is a wholly owned subsidiary of the Navigator Company, which is Portugal's uh, big pulp and paper company. Uh, and it's also Europe's uh, largest producer of office paper. Um, so Mozambique doesn't actually have a dedicated uh, forest landscape restoration or FLR a strategy at the moment. And in the absence of that, its AFR 100 pledge is based on uh, the World Bank supported forest investment program. There's lots of different terms, acronyms, uh, numbers, but you'll find it all in the, in the briefing, hopefully in an accessible format. Um, what Mozambique's forest investment plan uh, aims to do is to support Portocell, a private plantation company, to develop a model of plantation forestry that can be rolled out across the whole country. Uh, so Mozambique's pledge to AFR 100 is a million hectares of land, and whether coincidental or not, its target for tree plantation expansion is also a, um, a million hectares of land. Next, we'll hear about uh, Miro Forestry, which again has various different links to AFR 100, uh, and Elvis will talk to, to us more about that. And there's also a link to the Arboro Fund, uh, which I'll get to in a second. Uh, the third AFR 100 case study that we're going to look at is Unique, uh, which is a Germany-based private consultancy firm that acts as a consultant to, uh, to the public sector, to NGOs, to various other organizations, but is also a private sector plantation uh, investor. Uh, so Almond's going to talk to us more about the conflict of interest there. That's AFR 100. Uh, and then next we move on to the Green Climate Fund, which is the UNFCCC, so the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. It's its main funding mechanism. And one of the projects that the Green Climate Fund supports is the Arboro Fund, which is a, a private equity investment firm. Uh, so with the support of the Green Climate Fund, uh, Arboro aims to invest in 75,000 hectares of tree plantations across seven target countries, uh, four of which are uh, AFR 100 countries as well. Currently, uh, Arboro has three investments. So the first one was in uh, Miro uh, Forestry in Ghana. Uh, and the other two investments are Forestal Apapu and Forestal San Pedro in Paraguay, which Omar is going to talk to us about uh, in much more detail. Uh, and the link between Unique and Arboro is that uh, Unique was one of the two companies that founded uh, the Arboro Fund. So that's how everything fits together. Uh, I hope that's a useful interview, uh, uh, interview uh, overview. Uh, I'm gonna talk a bit more about the Bond Challenge and AFR 100, uh, and then I'll let uh, Omar and uh, Elvis and others cover the, the Green Climate Fund side of things. So uh, yeah, I suppose interest in, in the Bond Challenge and this kind of landscape restoration work started with uh, the publication of a, a paper, or, or our interest started with the publication of a paper in 2019. Uh, that was based on research done a couple of years before uh, that looked at how bond challenge pledges were going to be fulfilled by governments. So at the time, and with the information available, the, author, the authors of this paper uh, uh, found that almost half of bond challenge pledges were going to be met with tree plantations. And they said that this gave them great cause for concern uh, because of the fact that Firstly, plantations rarely store more carbon than what they replace, so what they're developed on. Secondly, the natural forests are 40 times better at storing carbon than plantations and six times better than agroforestry. So they were saying that of all the land restoration options, plantations are the worst. Uh, and then they also concluded by saying that natural regeneration is by far the cheapest and most effective option. 
Um, contrary to that, though, if you look at the latest uh, Bond Challenge progress reports, uh, the quote that I've highlighted here is that commercial plantations only account for 2.2% of current forest landscape restoration activities. Now, the, the problem at the moment is that there's very little monitoring of uh, land of ran restoration uh, that's been published. Uh, this is especially true for Africa, where monitoring capacity is, is basically uh, non-existent. Um, and so, um, uh, there's only uh, two countries that have actually carried out the what's called the Bond Challenge Barometer. So the barometer is like a country level assessment uh, of how restoration projects are being fulfilled. Uh, and just two AFR, country, AFR 100 countries have actually carried out so far. So that's basically the only thing that we have to go by as to how uh, restoration projects are being, are being fulfilled. Uh, and, and this is them. Uh, so first of all, since 2011, uh, Madagascar uh, has restored uh, 1.5 million hectares of land, and 82% of that was planted for us in woodlots, so plantations of one form or another. Uh, whereas natural regeneration was a was a small fraction of that. Uh, the other country is Rwanda, and its 700,000 hectares of restoration has been 50% planted for us in woodlots, and there's been no natural regeneration. So you know when when we saw that, that was also big cause for concern because. Uh, you know, contrary to what the quote that I just showed you in the, the latest assessment report of the Bond Challenge, this clearly shows that the two examples that we have in Africa are heavily based uh, around tree plantations. So we thought that in the absence of information on monitoring, we'd look at plans and pledges and how they link together. So uh, this map shows you uh, the orange countries are ones that uh, either don't have uh, an FLR strategy uh, or have an FLR strategy, but they don't include tree plantation targets. Um, but these are also ones that you know could be developing an FLR strategy. So at some point in the future, uh, they might have targets. Or the red ones are countries that uh, have FLR strategies with tree plantation targets in them, or they've got separate or concurrent tree plantation targets, which will almost doubtedly be included in the restoration uh, pledges. Um, so in total, we found that uh, over four and a half million hectares of commercial tree plantation expansion is planned. Uh, this is equivalent to about a doubling in the scale of existing tree plantations across Africa. Uh, there's also targets for uh, increased private sector involvement in forestry uh, and the improved management of existing plantations is also included uh, in a number of these targets. But if we go back to the paper in Natura, uh, the, that those authors were saying that natural regeneration is the cheapest and most effective landscape restoration option. So why this emphasis on plantations and, and planted forests? Essentially, if you have a focus on private sector involvement and investment, uh, then commercial projects like tree plantations will inevitably be prioritized. Uh, and this is why. So if you have uh, a monoculture plantation such as this one on the left, the benefits primarily go to the forestry industry that's developing them and the private sector investors that are backing them. Whereas if you have uh, other, other kinds of restoration, whether it be uh, natural regeneration, uh, whether it be community conservation, whether it be uh, community governed uh, forest uh, restoration, you know, the benefits of those kinds of uh, projects and approaches stay within the communities. Uh, all the benefits are directly to biodiversity or to the climate. And so it's basically much harder to turn a profit from that kind of restoration than it is with something uh, like a large scale commercial tree plantation project. So with that in mind, uh, today we're calling on uh, BMZ and the German government, we're calling on the Bond Challenge, AFR 100 and the Green Climate Fund to exclude tree plantations from climate mitigation efforts and not to finance them uh, in the name of forest restoration. And I've used up all my time and an extra minute, so I apologize for that and back to you, Lucy. Yeah, thank you very much. I think you timed it quite well, so there's no problem. Thank you very much. And now let I, I, I actually like the way you uh, did uh, um, the summary telling us exactly uh, the beginning on the presenters, how they are going to discuss different issues and also the issue of natural uh, you know, uh, restoration is more uh, cheaper and also it's much more better than uh, the plantations and so on. But I think this is something we can uh, reflect in our minds and I'm sure all these presentations will also be shared by, uh, by, by, by to, for many people to be able to uh, focus on it and to read further 
and collect more information. Let's now go to Mozambique and have Daniela Ribeiro, please go ahead. Hello, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Cool. So I'm going to do screen share quick. So can everybody see the presentation? Hi, everyone. Thank you very much. Um, so I just would like to make a quick um, mention that um, the actual the two coordinators for our lands um, land and um, livelihoods um, uh, program weren't available today. That's Vanessa and Matt. They're the real experts on this field um, and would be able to go much more detailed and have more expertise and experience. However, um, I am involved in the chaos of the campaign and I'll do my best to represent it as best as I can. So I'll be giving an example more specifically on Port to Self and um, yeah, the reality on the ground. Um, as it's been already mentioned, uh, the origins and, and where Port to Self comes from, its links. I'll focus on the actual projects in Mozambique. So um, there's two provinces that have a big um, presence. If we look um, on the map, it's Manika over here, this army green, and Fantasy, this army green over here. These are two provinces which they have um, plantations, and it's um, over 356,000 hectares, and it affects around 24,000 families, uh, almost all subsistence based. Um, small scale farmers. And don't forget, family units in Mozambique are quite large, depending on which district you look at, it averages from six up to 12 per family unit. So the number of people affected is huge. Um, for more details on the districts and all that, there's a table there. Um, so, yeah, so that's a quick um, run through. So, if one looks at the impact on local communities, um, the problem starts straight away from the first step. Um, very problematic community consultations with a lot of false promises that 10 years on haven't been met. The promises of boreholes, water, roads, the usual, the general comments on improvement of standard of living. Um, and a lot of these concerns, issues, and problems have been um, unanswered and unresolved for over a decade. Um, and, most, and, and spending time on the ground, you realize that um, the, there's a lot of community land loss. The area of these projects are vast, um, and um, it has a it's called, it has a huge um, it has huge problem, um, impacts on food production, food sovereignty, the increased conflicts, um, especially young families that are starting to get um, that are coming look um, that have now because it's been more than ten years. We have a lot of young families having difficulty finding land, finding, um, and also, of course, you can imagine future generations how this is going to um, worsen even even more. Um, the other issue that um, we often have is the way that Protocell has worked, it's because Protocell is seen as an example, like a pilot, like a lot of other companies are keeping an eye on Protocell and going to follow some of footsteps, which makes it concerning. So the one approach they had is. They made more than a hundred claims, small land claims, because it's easier. The, the, the EIAs, the requirements and all these standards, everything that needs to be done to get the land acquisition, it's smaller for small parcels, but bigger parcels have more, more requirements and are, seem to have more impact. So they've gone by by getting a whole lot of small parcels and, um, and very untransparent. A lot of public documents aren't made publicly available. Um, we had to go to court numerous times to get information um, especially monitoring reports, environmental monitoring reports, and or even the type of strains they're using in the monocultures, it is always a barrier. Um, then, after the land acquisition, they still went out and did over 1,700 contracts with local communities. Um, and these contracts are problematic because first, um, the land process doesn't um, foresee this or doesn't require it for the process. And so it's more seen as um, or trying to cover the skip steps and the bad steps and the problems that were during the land acquisition. So these contracts are trying to cover um, problems of the past. And because they came with the land title with the community saying, look, we already have a land title, sign this contract if you want to get jobs, um, provincial treatment and benefits from the project. And so they coerced a lot of communities to sign these contracts. And given that they already have got the land title from the government, 
it was the, the right people signed, but that's a very problem, problematic issue. Um, other issues that were very problematic uh, around the land acquisition um, has been exactly the lack of transparency and the, um, the, the threats and the uh, constant um, intimidation of community leaders that stop raising too many questions, and that's been a constant um, presence and pressure. Um, in total, there's been more than 78 formal community complaints and um, uh put to sell, um, and it's growing. Um, the other issue that I put to sell is very problematic is around false solutions, carbon credits, grids, and uh, reforestation strategies, as mentioned before. Um, Mozambique is a country that depends heavily on aid. Um, over 40% of the Mozambique um, national um, budget comes from donors like World Bank and um, EU. And Port of Sales has a very good relationship with the EU, and it has a very um, quite a big influence in the development of Mozambique's forest strategy, red strategy, and and how it's in, embedded. How do the green um, uh, the green economy is going to function within Mozambique? And that's concerning given the how they, the reality on the ground and how they treat communities and how they disrespect community land rights. Um, and a lot of this, and you see a lot of changes. Our national forest laws and the way Mozambique defines forest has changed due to this. Um, our now our current definition of, of forest no, it no longer has ecological or cultural or endemic component. It's very much based on a physical analysis of height of the tree, size of canopy, and density within the area. Um, and these were changes so they could include plantations as forests to then allow pro, um, processes of um, uh, like red and other plantations to be included in these initiatives. Um, and we see a lot of problems um, yeah, in the, the, the privatization and, and how the government has started to deal, deal with communities because to, to reforest, um, there's, there's a criminalization of communities and community lands are classified as degraded or deforested and therefore there's occupation of community land and reforestation uh, put, when it's in truth, monoculture on community land. It's a land grab and um, planting monoculture on community lands. But the narrative is being manipulated and that's a problem with uh, one of the things about um, for the self its ability to create a false narrative, a false, because um, if you look at what the cell has a very good reputation within the EU, it makes a huge propaganda on this social responsibility on being green, on helping climate, and all are based on lies on the ground. It is shocking the reality. Um, the other things, just to add final two comments, is one is uh, Mozambique did a land mapping in which they identified critical areas of food production to guarantee food sovereignty. And Purcell actually chose a lot of the areas that they've got lands on these areas and the district and provincial level um, um, government officials were concerned and raised these concerns, but it was overridden at a national level. And that's concerning because this is why there's so many people affected and why it's so critical. Another thing is a lot of the extractive industry, especially the gas, and especially in this case, any and Total, they, they're using these, this, and they, and they they using offsets um, from these initiatives to carry on doing fossil fuel extraction. And so it is um, critical that these projects go forward for their, um, to meet their, their targets and their so-called um, claims. So it's strongly linked to the gas, but then it's linked to the conflict. So my time's up, sorry for going over time, but that's basically um, a quick run of what's going on with the cell, but in those more details of questions. Thank you, and sorry if I went over time. Thank you very much, Daniel. I think that's a really um, good background and looking and listening to you. I was very worried about the communities there. It seems like they really don't have any voice that they can be heard. And also realize that as you talk about the land issues, uh, it brings me back to the uh, question of the pre-prior pre, uh, pre, pre informed consent for, cons for me being able to talk to the community and also to give their own ideas and in my view, it also looks like the rights issue is really a, a big problem there. So we hope that this particular presentation will bring up some of the issues uh, that can be discussed and uh, also be noted by the funders and also by the uh, country on what is happening to the community because we do all this to make sure that we have a better life for the community. So let's move on to Elvis Hopang Mensa from Ghana. 
and let's hear what uh, um, he has for us from that part of the West African country. Please go ahead. I hope my screen is shared. Yes, it's it's sharing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So so good afternoon. I'm Elvis Opomensa from Civic Response in Ghana. Civic Response is the Secretary for Forest Wars Ghana. So what this presentation will seek to do will be looking at the GCF support and mono plantation, a case study from, from Ghana. The outline will be what the GCF seeks to do based upon its own statement on, the, on their website. And we'll try to look at the experiences in Ghana to see whether uh, what is happening in Ghana, especially in terms of mono plantation, actually contribute to what GCF seeks to achieve. So around 2015, Ghana government made a commitment to plant 2 million hectares of land as part of its commitment on the, the AARF 100. So that, that was Ghana, the, the AFR 100. That, that was Ghana, Ghana government's commitment to plant 200 million hectares of land. And one of the one, and it's supposed to be doing this through private and public initiative. And one of the main sources of funding for some of these things is the Green Climate Fund. So there are other, other sources of funding through government budgeting, through other investment. But one of the sources of funding has been the Green Climate Fund. That's why I'm zooming in into the Green Climate Fund. So the Green Climate Fund, as we all know, was established by 194 governments. And it, at the website, it seeks to it seeks to limit or reduce greenhouse gases emissions in developing countries and also to help vulnerable society adapt to unavoidable impact of climate change. So these are two major things that the Green Climate Fund seeks to support. Based upon experience in Ghana here in terms of mono plantation, I try to see how mono plantation will either be in line or will not be in line with the objective of the Green Climate Fund. So the first question is that mono plantation reduce or limit or limit or reduce greenhouse gases emission in developing countries. Basically in Ghana here, most of the mono plantation that we have witnessed over the years has always been encouraging exhausted species. And when we, we look at exhausted species like ticks and eucalyptus, so that's what Myro, who, who, who is actually getting the funding from the, the, the Green Climate Fund is actually promoting teak, teak and, and eucalyptus. And also there are another company in Ghana here, APS, even though it's not getting its funding from the Green Fund, it's also doing a, a mono plantation. And most of the plant that they do are exotic species and they are eucalyptus and ticks. And when you look at eucalyptus and ticks, in terms of size and even longevity, the, absorbing of carbon is lesser than when you compare to the indigenous species in tropical forests. I always mention that it's not coincident that when it came to supporting restoration of forestation projects, the world we're looking at tropical forests because of the kind of species that we have over here. The, the, the species have the, 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 the possibility of absorbing more carbon than the exhaustive species. So the question is why will a green climate fund or any other fund in trying to reduce an emission or, with, or limit a, a emission will be investing in exhaustive species who have the capacity to, to reduce emission in the long run. And also most mono plantation are fast growing species with the ultimate aim to harvest, to cash in as quickly as possible, unlike the tropical forest indigenous species, which takes a long years to reach its harvest limit. So for instance, when you go to the, the Mario area or the, the, the other mono plantation area, the most of the species that they plant are, have always been the, the fast growing, the fast growing species. And which the idea behind it is for them to grow faster so that they can harvest them. So if the idea is for us to solve the issue of climate change and deforestation, why do you encourage companies to go into fast growing species so that they can harvest them at the shorter possible time. Instead of the indigenous species, which takes much longer time for them to reach its harvest limit for them to be, to be, to be harvested. Also mono plantation encourage wholesale clean as against enrichment planting. So yes, when you go to Maro area and other, other, other mono plantation 
places that I have visited in Ghana here. Normally, when they ac acquire the huge tracts of land, they normally clear all the land because they are doing monoplanting. They need a kind of tree species. So the, the already existing trees, the, the Udum, the Fram, and those trees already in the area, they, they clear off all of them before they, they do plantation. The question is, you need to deforest before you, you, you are forest. It doesn't make sense. So why don't we encourage enrichment planting? If you are to, to restore the forest back, then you need to enrichment planting, either than clearing off every tree before you re, you replant. It doesn't, for me, make a lot of sense. The, 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 last, the last question that we seek to ask is, does mono plantation help vulnerable society adapt to the unavoidable impact of climate change? That's what, one of the things that the Green Climate Fund seeks to, to, to achieve. And from experience on the ground, both, both at the, the Maru site and the APSD site have shown that most mon mono plantation lead to land grabbing. So because they need huge acres of land to do the mono plantation, and these are the land, like the first presenter said, these are the land that communities already occupied for, for farming. In terms of the Maru one, yes, it was in forest reserve, but some years back, government gave those reserves to farmers to do what we call the modified tonja system concept. So farmers were planting food crops and they were integrating trees in it. But when government took the land away from them and gave it to, to Mario, they sat all these communities. So communities lost access of land that they were farming to, to, to serve as a livelihood. And in terms of the APSD that I was, I'm talking about, it's not in forest reserve. It's, and office there whereby communities are farmers is the source of livelihood for communities. They were sacked from their land, I think about more than 20,000 20, hectares of land. Community members were sacked from it. And the, 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 the land was given to this company to, to plant eucalyptus. So this mono plantation over the years have suggested that it leads to a lot of land grabbing and loss of farmland to communities, which we all know the implications of, of, of in terms of food security and others. Mono plantation normally do not encourage restoration, restoration of ecosystem, which eventually leads to loss of biodiversity. We all know forest, forest is not just about the trees. Forest are the trees and the animals. And animals are comfortable living in an area that they, 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 they are used to. So once that you introduce new kind of species and they are mono plantation, they suck these animals from their habitats. And, and in doing that, you, we are reducing the issue around biodiversity. So, so for me, that does, and a lot of community also depend on this biodiversity for their livelihood in terms of non-timber forest products. So to communities, forests are not just the trees. Forests are the trees and other things associated with the trees, like the non-timber forest product. So if the concentration of the forest is just on the trees, which mono plantation encourage, then it, it deprives communities of their livelihood. Mono plantation also derive committee of their right to their culture and livelihood. Yeah, like I said, a lot of community culture depends on this forest. In terms of medicinal purposes and other things, some of the tree bags are used by as medicine for communities. So if you, you clear up these trees and you introduce a new kind of species, then communities are deprived of their culture and in terms of medicinal purposes and, and other, 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 other things. It also leads to exploitation of natural resources, which most of the time lead to abuse of life of local communities. Yes, in most of the mono plantations that I have visited, normally they are, they are forests, they are people, they are, they are guards. So some of them even employed soldiers to guard their plantations, which prohibits communities to, to, to pass through their plantation. So there are instances when they were acquiring the land, some communities live in the middle of their concessional area. So they are, their plantation have surrounded the communities. These communities need to move from their community to their nearby big community to buy things. And because now the place has been are under security guard, this community don't have the right to pass through this, this plantation. They need to pass through a longer distance to get to the near, the, the, the closest, the closer community. There are instances community who are abused that in who decide to pass through the plantation are being arrested and beaten by these this, this soldiers who are guiding this plantation, which for me, I think is an abuse of community, community, community rights. So, 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 so to, to, sum, to sum it up, I think GCF fund or any other public sector funding should support right-based restoration projects and not mono plantation in order to protect vulnerable society. 
some of the right based restoration project that we knew in Ghana here has been around the community resource management area, that's CREMA, whereby community have their own land and they develop it and they normally introduce indigenous species because of the importance of it. And what we call the modified tundra system. So government partner with communities and give areas of forest reserve to communities who do the plantation on their own. So they have access to their NTFP, they, drop, they, they plant food crops within the plantation, they have the food crops and when they treat them, they, then government takes over the forest. The, the, the forest reserve. So, so basically that's what my presentation all about. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Elvis, uh, bringing uh, quite a lot of issues and even bringing the right suspect. And uh, I actually like the way you also explain what uh, plantations, what the communities uh, know as the forest. It's not only the trees that are there, but also the issue of food, water, medicine, and even most of the time also ceremonial areas where it's not only trees, but have also other um, you know, issues within the forest areas. Thank you so much for that presentation. And now let's go to, uh, um, let's go to Halmuth and uh, Biofuels uh, uh, area discussion. And I think from UK and the uh, Biofuels uh, um, Watch has been very active for many years on this particular discussion. So we'll be uh, happy to hear from you, Almut. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Sorry, um, share. And slide show, one sec. Huh. Okay, can you see okay? Sorry, everyone. Oh, is this? Yeah, we can hear you and we can, can see. see. All right. Yeah. Okay, great. So I'm looking at, as Oli mentioned at the beginning, at one of the technical partners uh, of AFR 100, which is a uh, um, German based unique forestry and land use GmbH. Uh, I just called it unique um, throughout now. Um, and really looking at the role that they play, uh, which is, yeah, quite interesting, I think. Um, now, first of all, who is this? What is this company? So they describe themselves as a forest management and consultancy company, consultancy of forestry, land use change, including agriculture. And they really do three things, uh, which uh, immediately, you know, raise our alarm about, you know, com you know, how they actually feed into each other. And that's what I'll be looking at. The first one is consultancy. So they are consultant, regular consultants to GIZ in Germany, World Bank, European Investment Bank, government, private companies, uh, some large conservation NGOs and others. Then they also directly manage tree plantations in Paraguay, and we will hear more about those in, uh, I think it's the next uh, presentation or one very soon. Uh, and on top of that, we've already heard of Arbor Fund. Um, they, Arbor Fund is owned jointly by Unique GmbH and, um, yeah, and another company. So I get to that. So I've already mentioned you know, the direct management of tree plantations uh, currently only in Paraguay. And then uh, the fact that they, they are directly uh, private, you know, attracting public and in theory private, but so far mostly public investment uh, into tree plantation companies, including Myra Forestry, which we just heard from heard about from the previous speaker. Uh, in fact, yeah, Myra, you know, in, in Ghana and Sierra Leone, they, they are the you know the first they've been for. Um, amongst the very first investments, uh, but they're targeting seven different countries. And it's important that that includes, for example, Ethiopia, which is also, um, uh, which is also uh, one of the AFR 100, another of the AFR 100 countries, as of course, Sierra Leone. So I've, what, I'm, what I've done in the unique related chapter in, the, in our report is, uh, and what I'm, I do next is looking at some different examples of uh, of their activities and uh, you know what, what I see kind of you know the very dubious role um, and you know I think class of interest. So let's look at Madagascar. Madagascar is one country with um, you know published forest landscape restoration commitments uh, under AFR 100 bond challenge and uh, they include um, you know quite a strong plant tree plantation element and um, unique 
was actually uh, commissioned by GIZ, uh, you know, the German Development Agency GIZ to um, identify the potential for FLR, for forest landscape restoration, before the strategy was drawn up. And they identified fast grown tree plantations, including for bioenergy, as well as restoration of industrial pine plantations as key priorities, which, as we then saw, were actually uh, adopted by the government. So really, you know, quite significant role. And a similar one uh, in, um, oh no, I just realized, sorry, that should be Ethiopia. Oops, oops, oops. Um, okay, in Ethiopia, very, very similar. Again, UNIT was uh, commissioned by the GIZ to help draw up Ethiopia's forest landscape restoration strategy. That strategy includes a very high element of uh, increased uh, tree plantations. Ethiopia already has more industrial tree plantations than any other country in Africa, except for South Africa. Uh, and a lot of those are eucalyptus. Um, and now, you know, based to, to some extent on UNIQ's advice, there will be more. And Ethiopia is a country where Arboro Fund hopes to invest in future. Uh, now, another one I looked at is Tanzania, where um, they were so Tanzania is, an, is a country which is uh, put 230,000 hectares more tree plantations into its commitments, um, AFR 100 commitments. And um, Unique has already, you know, benefited from that, uh, you know, from, from work in tree plantations in Tanzania. They've done two projects for the largest tree plantation company. And uh, quite uh, shockingly, I found an investigation by in the Guardian in 2017 that showed that those very plantations uh, replaced and destroyed wildlife rich habitats, including um, habitat of, um, uh, of elephants. So, um, yes, now, uh, then, in yeah, and one other way, you know, Kenya, Kenya also has got AFR 100 commitments, which include 400,000 hectares new tree plantations. And since, you know, since AFR 100 was launched, Unique has benefited from three new consultancy contracts, which have been linked to that expansion of tree plantations, you know, this picture of one of them. Uh, uh, then, uh, you know, last quick look at, uh, you know, that, you know, the role in AFR 100 isn't just to advise, um, you know, other partners, but they even got, uh, you know, other technical partners and to, you know, and to, to be consulted for GIZ, private companies and so on. But they even um, got commissioned to write the mid to write the midterm review of AFR 100, you know, themselves um, as, a, as a consultancy. And in that that uh, you know, in that review, surprise, surprise, they rated the entire first phase of uh, of uh, the program as very successful. Uh, they gave it 90% for sustainability. And they did acknowledge that there was concerns over land conversions, including um, including native forests uh, conversion to tree plantations. But basically said, you know, to uh, paraphrase, it's too soon to see any any of those un unintended con oh, consequences. Apologies. Um, now um, and uh, what? also struck me not to do with plantations but was found quite shocking is that they um, that they actually justified uh, forced resettlements of communities from protected areas quite explicitly in it uh, so conclusion uh, so basically yeah unique place place uh, you know um, the multiple roles of whereby they are promoting as consultants and then financially benefiting from the expansion of tree plantations in Africa, uh, as well as Latin America. They've been doing that for a long time. Um, I believe that we believe that they cannot be seen as unbiased expert consultants, given their, you know, their very material interests and, uh, you know, uh, contracts they've had in relation to um, advice uh, to tree plantation companies, but in some, you know, certainly in Paraguay, the management of them, and uh, to our fund as private investors, uh, or as, you know, as um, one of the two partners in a private investment uh, company attracting public funds into tree plantations. 
and uh, you know really huge concern that this is a clear clash of interest uh, between advising governments and then benefiting from the very policies that they've advised um, uh, governments and um, and institutions to implement in the first place. Okay, that's me. Much, uh, um... Amuth, and thank you for your presentation, which is a very interesting one, and actually tells uh, a lot from the funds that you have already explained and the long-term uh, implication in terms of looking at that. And now let's go to uh, Omar to, um, from Paraguay to present to us. And uh, I think Amuth had already mentioned you, so it would be great uh, to hear from you what you have for us. Thank you. Omar? Buen día. Eh, ¿se, ¿Se me escucha? ¿Se ve mi proyección ahí? Sí. Ok, buen día. Yo soy Omar Yampey del Centro de Estudios eh, Genio y de Paraguay. Y un poco la idea es compartir el caso de Arbaro en, en Paraguay que invierte, digamos, en dos, eh, en dos empresas forestales. And I'm going to speak about uh, two forest studio, pero sí os invito a que puedan eh, este, leer los después el resumen y el trabajo completo. Sí señalar algunos elementos que me parecen importantes. Eh, esto que, que planteaba Oliver al comienzo, hay como una conexión en el sistema mundo, en la economía mundo entre instituciones. Eh, organismos económicos, instituciones eh, políticas sobre esta idea, este consenso de reducir los, los daños ocasionados eh, eh, a causa del modelo productivo, por el cambio climático y el, el calentamiento global, pero el disenso, digamos, y acá es donde el rol eh, que juega este trabajo que está haciendo la coalición global por los bosques, Esto de celebrar la resistencia el 21 de septiembre y denunciar estas falsas soluciones es importante porque el disenso está en cuáles son las causas de esta crisis eh, ecosocial, digamos, y cuáles son las, las soluciones. Ahí decíamos, es importante eh, señalar el rol del, del conocimiento científico, el, el rol de la, del, del conocimiento crítico para poder cuestionar esas nociones dominantes eh, acerca de esta crisis actual y, digamos, eh, atravesar estas falsas soluciones al problema. En ese sentido, en Paraguay, en los últimos eh, años y, y, y puntualmente ahora, en el, a partir del 2019, se ve con mayor nitidez cómo hay un negocio forestal que se está instalando con mayor énfasis, ¿verdad? Y hay una interacción ahí entre el poder político institucional y agentes del mercado local e internacional que si bien hay algunas novedades en, en el discurso, esto de, en, el, en el sentido de un de New Green Deal, ¿verdad? Tipo de, de reverdecer al sistema, en, en, de fondo se reproduce el modelo vigente de agroexportación y de extracción primaria y por consiguiente acaparamiento de tierra y expulsión de comunidades indígenas y campesinas. Además señalar que... Eh, el trabajo de, 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 del estudio de caso, digamos, se inserta en un, en un proyecto más amplio, en una campaña más amplia que se está desarrollando en Paraguay, donde el Centro de Estudios de Genio está cumpliendo, digamos, una, un rol importante y el estudio lo que busca, eh, digamos, aportar es la dimensión, la dimensión territorial desde el punto de vista de las comunidades y de los sujetos eh, afectados, ¿verdad? Eh, Bueno, acá tampoco me voy a detener, pero sí es importante señalar que el estudio es fundamentalmente cualitativo, ¿verdad? Se basa en el sentido que, que la, la, los sujetos, las comunidades le dan a, a, a la implantación de estas forestales a Pepú y San Pedro, ¿verdad? Y después una proposición general que es la que orienta, digamos, el trabajo, esto, el negocio forestal, son procesos extractivos y agroindustriales de despliegue del sistema económico dominante sobre la naturaleza que genera los conflictos ambientales y tres categorías que son clave que permiten organizar también el, el pensamiento, ¿verdad? Desterritorialización, descomunización 
y extinción de las condiciones de reproducción biótica. Decíamos también que es importante tener un espejo regional porque si en América del Sur eh, ya data esto, esta implantación del modelo eh, de negocio forestal, digamos, de décadas atrás. Entonces decíamos ver el desarrollo, la dinámica de este proceso en América del Sur para poder tener elementos de referencia para resistir mejor a el, la implantación del modelo. En síntesis, ahí los autores que, que fueron revisados eh, señalan los efectos negativos en, el, en, el, en, el, en la implantación del modelo, en el ciclo del agua, en el ciclo de nutrientes, en la composición química del suelo, en la fauna y también en las condiciones socioeconómicas de la población humana. Fundamentalmente en, el, en los aspectos de generación de empleo y las condiciones de precariedad y de explotación, ¿verdad? Que es mucho el discurso de estos eh, organismos de generar empleo, etc. El, en el contexto local hicimos como una línea de tiempo de cómo se va eh, implantando esta, este modelo de negocio forestal. Y a partir de la década del 70 en adelante se ven como sucesivas eh, eh, formas de legalización, ¿verdad? Y de expansión eh, de las plantaciones eh, de eucalipto en su mayoría, ¿verdad? Pero en la, en la década del 2010 en adelante se incorpora esto que algunos llamaban una racionalidad estratégica. Al principio era como más disperso y no estaba, no estaba pensado en clave de maximizar la ganancia. A partir del 2010 sí se incorporan actores locales e internacionales y ahí empieza, digamos, a crecer exponencialmente eh, la concentración de tierras para la eh, plantación de, eh, de esta especie nativa de eucalipto en particular. Eh, bueno, y bajo este periodo de gobierno, sí, ya más se explicita esta, legal, esta legalidad y se crea la ley de apertura al mercado internacional para la exportación de maderas de especies exóticas y está en desarrollo la construcción de eh, la planta de celulosa para cel. Es decir, se incorpora también el elemento de industrialización eh, de las plantaciones. Y al día de hoy, de... 10.000 hectáreas en la década del 70, ahora hay alrededor de 200.000. Y acá un poco como entre el 2015, en cinco años, el crecimiento exponencial eh, de plantación, de, de concentración de tierras para la plantación de estos árboles. ¿verdad? Decimos que es una política forestal antinacional. Tampoco me voy a detener acá porque otros que me precedieron en el uso de la palabra ya señalaron cómo hay una, esto del sistema eh, económico eh, mundial y cómo hay, digamos, eh, instituciones intermedias y en lo local. Pero en lo local, en Paraguay, puntualmente, lo, el fin, el objetivo es producción de biomasa para secado de grano, es decir, para eh, reducir los costos eh, de la cadena de valor de el, del, agro, del agronegocio, para secar los granos de soja, de maíz, de trigo, etcétera, y combinación con la ganadería, sistema silopastoril que le llamo. La compañera eh, Almut ya mencionó un poco cuál es el rol de UNIC, acá eh, eso, invierten en, en PAICO y otras cosas más, no me voy a detener ahí, y Fondo Arbaro en Paraguay, invierte en Forestal Apepú del 2019, y alcanza alrededor de 6.000 hectáreas para la producción de eucalipto en San Pedro. San Pedro es uno de los departamentos con mayores índices de deforestación de la región oriental del país y presenta los índices más elevados de pobreza y pobreza extrema eh, a escala nacional. ¿verdad? También invierte en Forestal San Pedro. Ahora en el 2021 hubo algunas, eh, algunos, eh, algunas inversiones y maneja alrededor de 8.000 hectáreas de plantación forestal. La característica de la Forestal San Pedro es que no está centralizado en un departamento o en un territorio, sino está disperso en el departamento de San Pedro y otros departamentos. Sin embargo, only based on one state, but it works on a number of states. Is the decentralized. So we could see uh, the, the impact of many of this uh, other Uh, related to all these other other states and the in, in investment because all this land is being bought. The Por los bosques se puede resumir en ra las razones sociales, económicas y ecológicas. No hay beneficio a las comunidades y causan conflictos 
eh, eh, por la tierra, ¿verdad? Los trabajos son temporales y esto es un desastre ecológico. Así lo, lo caracterizan las organizaciones. Acá podemos ver cómo Forestal Apepú sí está, digamos, tiene una, eh, está centralizado en un determinado punto. Sin embargo, a la derecha eh, se puede ver una de las tierras arrendadas por la Forestal San Pedro en la comunidad Barbero Cue, una comunidad que históricamente tiene un problema de titulación de tierra y de conflicto por ella. Y hasta ahora no se resuelve, sin embargo, el modelo de, 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 de negocio forestal sí se puede desarrollar y lo otro, digamos, que siempre es como una, eh, un problema latente que no está resuelto. Y sobre ese problema ellos sí se despliegan económicamente. Y bueno, acá el punto de vista de las comunidades, que es lo que nosotros decíamos, es la, la centralidad del, del estudio y esta tensión entre agronegocio o comunidad. Y como ya sabemos todas las personas que estamos acá, para que sea eh, rentable económicamente la, la, la plantación comercial de estos árboles, requiere de grandes extensiones de tierra. Entonces, es la condición sin la cual no eh, desplazar comunidades de sus medios de subsistencia naturales y simbólicos, ¿verdad? Y ahí también hay un juego de asimilación, no es solamente una intervención eh, belicosa al estilo de, de la soja o del ganado, donde sí había también una, una dimensión eh, de, de violencia activa para eh, acaparar las tierras. Acá no, acá hay un discurso más reverdecedor y también esta idea de generar trabajo. Entonces eso también va como desmantelando la comunidad. Y ahí más adelante vamos a ver cómo es que se da eso. Paseando por, el, paseando por, por la zona, en el, por lo menos de las comunidades colindantes de, eh, de la forestal Apepú, uh, hubo un relato que a mí me, me llamó poderosamente la atención porque decía el, el, el productor de la zona que, que ahí por la plantación de eucaliptos, no había nada. Decía silencio total, no hay pájaros, ¿verdad? Sin embargo, donde están nuestros árboles nativos, sí se alegran los pájaros, decía acá, donde estaban los, la, los eucaliptos, silencio total, ¿verdad? Y también algo que ahí se puede identificar es que la mayoría de esas estancias que ahora están siendo destinadas a la plantación de eucalipto fueron, por lo menos desde la década del 70, del 80, eh, estancias productoras de soja transgénica, de maíz transgénico y de ganado, ¿verdad? Conflicto por la tierra y bienes comunes, esto se da en casi todas las, en casi, se replica en casi todas las entrevistas que se, que se dieron en mayor o menor medida de forma particular y el lote de una familia o de forma comunitaria, pero está ahí eh, el elemento de la conflictividad social por la tierra y los bienes comunes, ¿verdad? Y bueno, ahí dicen algunos, esto era todo población, sin embargo, la inseguridad de la tenencia de la tierra, que es una particularidad del Paraguay, que no está resuelta y es como una condición estructural eh, que, bueno, estas empresas dicen que van a venir a resolver y van a dar desarrollo, pero eh, niegan toda esa historicidad de, de, de estructura desigual que el Paraguay tiene. Entonces, antes... Eh, por poca plata compraban a la gente eh, las tierras, bueno, y se fueron ocupando, dicen, ¿verdad? Y acá la, el, el mecanismo de, de, de descomunizar o de desmantelar la, la, la integración comunitaria. Esa precondición de crisis de la agricultura familiar campesina, más estas condiciones estructurales de acceso desigual a la tierra, de superposición de títulos, etcétera, etcétera, eh, hace que se pueda instalar en el imaginario de los productores que la plantación de monocultivo de eucalipto es una oportunidad para mejorar los ingresos. Similar al mecanismo que la soja eh, empezó a instalar en los últimos años. Es decir, la soja equivalente a eh, destrucción de ambiente, contaminación y de grandes productores, la, el contradiscurso que hacen ellos es no, también los pequeños productores de la agricultura familiar campesina se insertan y pueden ser exitosos cuando eso en realidad es falso. Similar mecanismo con el, el monocultivo de, de, de eucalipto, ¿verdad? Y ahí entra esta figura de el, el, la agricultura por contrato o outgrower, que más adelante vamos a ver brevemente de qué trata. Y bueno, ahí decía una pobladora, 
eh, te rodean las empresas, después si plantas tu mandioca ya no sirve, eh, te van acorralando, porque la particularidad de la forestal APEPU es que se, se constata en el territorio una territorialización asfixiante, es decir, compraron todas las estancias que están alrededor de un radio de, de, de bien amplio y están plantando, digamos, de forma masiva. Entonces eso eh, perciben los productores como una amenaza y ya lo ven en sus árboles frutales, en, su, en sus árboles de en su producción de autoconsumo, como la mandioca y otros. Eh, esta imagen es muy elocuente porque esto es un camino a la comunidad eh, Julián Portillo que está pegada a la, a la forestal La Pepú. Está privatizada. Y bueno, en el diálogo con los, con los pobladores ahí de la, de la comunidad eh, me manifestaron que esto generó y genera cierto nivel de conflictividad. No muy explícito, pero genera ahí una crispación porque ellos eh, son los que eh, imponen el horario de, de digamos, de, de poder acceder a la, a la comunidad, etc. Eh, bueno, el compromiso social es un concepto que está muy instalado en, el, en los estudios de impacto ambiental de ambas forestales. Y ahí hay como un glosario de qué tipo de compromiso social. Nada de lo que ellos dicen se contrasta con la evidencia empírica. Todo lo que ellos dicen es contradictorio con lo que la gente manifiesta. No hay una información eh, clara sobre el proyecto, no hay un beneficio a la comunidad. Eso que dicen que van a ayudar con huertas es como muy escaso y selectivo, ¿verdad? Y hay como mecanismos de, por ejemplo, a ciertos dirigentes de, la, de ciertas comunidades lo asimilan y le dan empleo puntuales a él o a sus hijos para que vayan instalando en la comunidad esta idea de que es bueno plantar el talento, ¿verdad? Pudimos conversar con un operario de la estancia Pepú, ahí él sintetizaba las relaciones de trabajo, esto es eh, eh, trabajo inestable, inseguro, es precario, sí. es precario. Bueno, y acá el, el modelo, el outgrower o anexión al modelo forestal. Esto en síntesis, los, los productores señalaban es pérdida de autonomía, es una lógica eh, extraña a la, a la cultura de trabajo campesino, ¿verdad? Y hay una, unas restricciones que son muy severas. Ellos por determinado a 13 años no van a poder tener animales en esa superficie, no van a poder disponer de sus tierras, eh, entre otras cosas más, ¿verdad? Pudimos acceder al documento eh, de Ad Grover o de... Omar, please, the time is up. Ok. Y acá voy cerrando. Eh, en Paraguay lo que se observa es la imposición de un modelo de negocio forestal que refuerza esos procesos extractivistas y de agronegocio, si bien se instalan con un discurso de generación de empleo, de economía sustentable, etc., el Fondo Arbaro adquiere e invierte en, en empresas que se han dedicado históricamente a la soja y al ganado y es una territorialización asfixiante de las plantaciones. Esto hace que se pierda la soberanía y las capacidades comunitarias de organización y resistencia. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Omar, and sorry for stopping you. But I think uh, time was uh, on, not on our side, especially that you had a lot to explain, and you took a quite good time actually to explain to us what's happening there in Paraguay. And I just wanted to uh, leave you and give you more time because of the region that you are representing. Thank you so much. And we, we see it clearly. I remember Paraguay very well, especially when they were uh, growing the soya beans and the chemicals that were being used there. So it looks like uh, problems will never cease to end in many of these uh, countries that we have. But I'm glad you were able to explain and give us many examples of what is happening out there. Thank you very much, panelists. I think you really did a good uh, uh, job in, uh, in terms of looking at the time and uh, also uh, making sure that we didn't have so much to, I mean, we didn't have to struggle a lot in terms of time. But now we all, I want to open up for, um, for some questions that are, um, you know, discussion and the questions that emerged. And I have like uh, 
almost uh, three questions that are already on the chat, on the question and answers. One of it is uh, in the GFC, the Arboro Fund was sold by saying that this could be reforestation or degradation land. If this is not, if, if this is not the, the case, in the Arboro uh, supported micro uh, plantation in Ghana, investment in, isn't it? Isn't this clearly contradicting the statement? Prem, uh, statement? Could there be an in, interesting, could there be an interesting to bring uh, this case before the independent uh, redress the mechanism of the uh, green, uh, green fund, uh, you know, green climate fund? And I think this question goes to uh, Meza from Ghana. And then we also have another question. How mono plantation deprive community rights of culture? How does it do that? I think all the participants can be able to address that because uh, most of you all were able to do that. But we'd like to know who could uh, uh, pick on that. And uh, we also have, I don't think unique financially benefit, uh, benefiting Ethiopia. That was from Almud. And uh, yes, those are some of the questions that we have. If uh, maybe the panelists could raise their hands and then raise, uh, then answer some of those questions. Uh, Elvis, please go ahead. Okay, so I'll pick the one that was directly linked with Ghana. Yeah. So what I know about the Mario one was, actually the land that was given to Mario was already occupied by communities who were doing, so Forestry Commission used the land to the district assembly some years back. Mm -hmm. So that particular land was being managed by the district assembly and the district assembly leased the land to some community members to, 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 to do modified to injure concepts on it. So they were planting and they were, they were growing uh, thick trees on it. So before the land was given to Mario, that land was already occupied and there were some thick trees on it. Actually, there are some private developers who are even having case with Mario in court because they, Mario came and destroyed their plantation. So uh, it would be surprised to, to hear that the land was totally degraded. Uh, that, that, that will not be the entire truth. Actually, I have equally visited some area whereby there were some thick trees and there were already bulldozers on the field to, to play those thick trees. So it will not be entirely true on part of Mario to say that the land was totally de 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 degraded. That, that can be the truth. In terms of the second portion about how monoculture affects community culture, like I mentioned in the presentation, forest to communities, forest is not just the trees. It's the trees and the other things that goes to the trees, like the water, the animals, and other things. And you know, we all, we all know that culture is the way the, the way of the way people live their their their, their life how, how they, they live their life this community relied on this forest for their medicinal purposes so there are some of the tree species fish community used for medicinal purposes they also assess non-timber forest but that are their source of their source of food so the one that you take this thing away from them then you are you are affecting their way of living, their way of life, which is, which is their culture in terms of medicine, in terms of how they even eat and how they interact with nature. So, so that's what we mean by monoculture affecting people's culture. Thank you very much. Uh, could any other uh, panelists answer the other questions? Almut, there was a question for you. Yeah, I just responded. Basically, I'm not quite yeah. sure uh, exactly what the question was, but I think it refers to things that are answered in the references. You know, the um, kind of the, the project uh, that Unique is carry is doing in Ethiopia. We've actually taken them directly from the Unique uh, GmbH um, website project list, and there's a reference to you know a web references in the uh, in the in the report. So I hope. That will answer uh, those references. Will answer that question. Great. Maybe. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Almut. Uh, maybe who could answer the one, the other one, which referred to in the GFC Arborofana? 
Olivia, do you want to answer that or do you? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, uh, well, I, well, my answer would be that sounds like a great idea. Uh, definitely. Um, I think we, yeah, we've we've obviously identified that uh, there are serious problems with uh, with the, the tree plantation approach. Um, we've got good examples now of uh, you know how bad the projects are that Abro has already invested in in. Um, Ghana and in Paraguay and so we we need some sort of mechanism to go forward uh, and to prevent new projects from being uh, financed under the same under the same mechanism um, so uh, uh, yeah uh, I think what what, what Leanne uh, suggests is, is is a great idea um, because look, this is this is the tip of the iceberg right um, it's 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 one of the the first of these private sector plantation projects that's gone through GCF, and uh, for a lot of people involved in the campaign at the time, we thought it was, uh, you know, going to be a good indication of the the future of things to come, uh, because so much of climate finance is focused on leveraging private sector involvement and investment now. Uh, you know, essentially, um, the 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 money that northern governments have pledged to fight uh, the climate crisis isn't materializing, and so. The emphasis now is on trying to get the private sector to cover a lot of those costs, really simplistically speaking. So we're going to see more and more private sector involvement uh, uh, in climate mitigation projects uh, and more and more public finance going into to private sector projects. So uh, it's really important that we, you know, we take these examples that we've got, these case studies, and we use them to, to prevent uh, future projects like this um, and to prevent more sub projects going through the process. Um, uh, led by Arboro. Uh Yeah, so let's, then we should talk more about this afterwards, definitely. Thank you very much. And I see a lot of complimentary, uh, um, you know, discussion in the in the chat, and also others wanting to, con uh, to communicate with the panelists, which is really good, because then you have the sharing and uh, awareness in terms of looking at different issues. Uh, is there anyone else who has a question and answers the other Questions I have is that uh, Biseo Shibababwa Abate says how how mono plantation deprived community rights of culture. I think uh, Emeza really explained it very well, and he did uh, uh, you know explain how monocultures are they, they they don't really communities don't look at it like just forests, but they look at many more. And uh, uh, that he answered it very well, but we can still be able to send you the question even though you feel like uh, the answers, even though you feel like it's, uh, it's something that you are not very comfortable with. And then there is a question, please, yeah, okay. Uh, please, your comments on the following proposal anyway. So that some of these are the, some of the issues also which have come up and uh, would like to continue opening up the floor. We have a few minutes before we wind up and I think it will be great to have more questions. In case you have seen any panelists, if you have seen any um, any 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 question in the in the chat, please feel free to answer it. It will be really helpful. Sometimes it's very difficult to look at the questions that come up, especially in the chat. You can um, maybe raise your hand or maybe just uh, um, intercept in and say, Omar, do you have anything you want to add as a winding up? I want to start with you. Omar. Okay, maybe we go to. Uh, no, yo creo que es suficiente. Okay. Pedir disculpas al auditorio por que me extendí en la exposición, pero la verdad que es un tema muy apasionante. Pero nada más que agregar. Quedo atento a lo que okay. se vaya señalando. Muchas gracias. No problem at all. Thank you very much, Omar. Daniel, do you have anything you want to add? As we wind up, um, no, no, most of it is covered. I just can add a few other aspects to the um, issue around um, the impact on community, culture, and habits um, based on Mozambique. Uh, for example, with um, Protocell, what you notice is um, community traditional land uses don't fit sometimes the formal land law and rights. So, and and a lot of the practices have evolved. 
um, based on um, more dynamic systems in which there is movement, there's a lot of common land, and it's not always an individual land ownership based approach, which is the way these companies work. Um, so you do have, um, and right now, for example, but to sell in many of the places, communities aren't, aren't managing to practice their traditional land use um, because of the, the, the fact that, um, first of all, the way the, um, the land loss, um, but also the way the right land claims were made were at the individual level. And a lot of community land that doesn't have individual owner um, was not accounted for. So a lot of times you have a situation, if you add up all the individual land rights, all the individual land plots, it's um, usually about 20 to 30% of the actual community land. Um, and it's much harder to defend the, the because government and companies have a tendency to classify that as unused, unoccupied. Um, the other issue as well is also on community um, leadership structures. You see um, strong leaders being targeted, and then you see the government in putting in forcefully um, uh, leadership um, structures that are um, loyal to the party or the government. So you have a breaking down, sabotaging, um, oppression, and um, purpose um, um, destruction of traditional community structures and decision-making processes um, when these processes challenge these um, companies and the interests of the political elite. And you have that in some areas in the protocell projects. So we see um, the way communities organize, the way the communities make decisions, their stru traditional structures, and how um, all of this breaking down. And that's um, um, critical for, um, and sometimes even when we have battles, like there's been cases where one case um, and got land back. But that type of damage takes a lot of time to recover. The ecological damage, the social damage, and the loss of these leadership structures and um, practices can have a devastating long-term effect, even when you win the case and get your land back. So just to add that component um, to the debate, thank you very much. Thank you very much. There is a final, final question. Could any of the presenters be able to discuss some of the gender differentiated impact of those approaches? Could any one of you pick that up? And there's also another question. It could be interesting to hear from Unique about these issues. Are they um, aware about this call and these allegations? Maybe let's pick up first in Almuth about the Unique um, Unique about what is the last question whether they are really glad of that. Well, first of all, I would say, oh, hang on, I'll put, the, I'll put the video on. First of all, I would say that the information we got is really via web searches, uh, largely via a lot of them uh, from Unique's uh, own website. So I don't think you're speaking of allegations, you're speaking of the fact that, uh, you know, you've got a consultancy company, which obviously you know like any company you know maximizing uh, you know income shareholder profit whatever i don't know exactly how they are you know in terms of shareholders are not i'm not quite sure how they are organized that way but basically yeah it's a private company that's making money from consultancy contracts and they publish what they are uh, that's all quite above board as far as that goes the real issue is uh, is with the fact that uh, you've got um, a div, you know, div, um, GIZ, you've got, uh, you know, from German government funding, and you've got the World Bank, you've got the European Investment Bank, and you've got the Secretariat of AFR 100, granting consultancy con contracts to advise governments in, um, you know, advise governments in Africa and other parts of the global south um, on, you know, the best policies, and they're doing so uh, even though they can and ought to know, because it's all in the public domain, that the same consultancy firm is doing work for private plantation companies, and in some cases, um, you know, in Paraguay directly managing plantations, and that they are co, uh, you know, they are co-founder and one of the two leading parties in our fund. So for me, the issue is not that those are allegations against Unique, because uh, there is actually a fair level of transparency in what they are doing, you know. Um, they're not keeping, it's not about being secretive. Uh, the real issue is uh, to those, uh, you know, is, is 
uh, using a consultancy with those very, uh, you know, very clear vested interests related to plantations as advisors in relation to international climate finance. And that's what I think is wrong. And that's what I think needs to be really, really questioned. Thank you, Almu. Thank you for that uh, very important uh, clarification. Now, who could uh, come up with this? Could any of the presenters be able to discuss some gender differentiated impacts or those approaches? Oh, Elvis, you, you have uh, your hand up. Please go ahead. No, so, so, so for instance, the, when, when you come to Ghana, <laughs> Mostly women are the people who pick what we call the non-timber forest products. And once that you have a mono plantation, it affects this non-timber forest product, like they snail the mushrooms and other things. This, these people goes along with the indigenous species. So once that you have this monoculture, this kind of non-timber forest products have been affected. And it affects women because they are the beneficiaries of this, mostly this non-timber forest product. They pick them and they sell them, they make a living out of it. So, so that's the gender dimension out, out, out of this. I think the one last thing I would like to add is uh, Daryl raised an issue about the linkages between the mono plantation and how, how we align the discussion with other international discussion like the, the national determinants contribution. So, so for me, I think it's a critical question that we, we need to be also be looking at. How, how does this especially developing countries and this is address this issue of mono, mono plantation. Most of them just mentioned we are going to plant 10,000 hectares, 20,000 hectares. Are they safeguards in there to safeguard community rights against mono plantation? I think it's something that we should be, we should be interested in. In Ghana, civil society presented a position on this. Having seen the final document to see whether government considered a safeguard to protect community rights against this large scale acquisition and mono plantation in the NDCs. But I think it should be something that in going forward, we should be looking at whether it reflects in the most of the NDCs being presented in the Paris Agreement. Thank you very much, Elvis. And I would actually like to add on what you have said, especially about the women, considering that some of them, especially the hunter gatherers in our different uh, continents, they depend much on forests. So if you bring in plantation, honestly, you are just destroying their life because that's where they get their, their, their medicine and also they get their building materials for their own houses because in most of the cultures, the Libby people, uh, you know, women are the one who build and so on. So I think it's, uh, thank you so much for bringing out that. And uh, uh, I don't see more questions. And what I would really like to really say, this is very important discussion, <clears throat> important that, uh, as you know, this is the decade for um, ecosystem restoration. I think it's really uh, wonderful that we have to have this discussion. As we know that, and that has been clearly um, explained by Oliver at the beginning, that natural uh, forest, you know, natural restoration is very uh, important. It benefits all uh, uh, restoration uh, efforts, and also it helps us to protect our biodiversity, adapt and mitigate climate change. We must actually look at this very seriously and push with uh, the government, considering that this particular day is uh, uh, on monocultures are days that uh, uh, you know communities and especially civil society really oppose and create awareness on different uh, issues that impact on different communities, different people on plant on monocultures. And I, I I just look at it all, and I think by the time I started off, I was trying to say that. I hope by the end of this particular webinar, you'll have, you know, uh, convinced you are, you'll have been convinced that monocultures are really and the plant tree plantations are not something that we would like at all in our countries. And uh, I hope you did the same. And if not, please continue writing to Global Forest Coalition. I think also the the studies are there, though they are still embargo. But as soon as they are out, we have all the <clears throat> the emails and the list and we'll be able to, uh, to share that. I think also a lot had been already shared on the, on, the webin on, the, on the chat. So this will be really wonderful to also continue following it up and writing us many questions. And I'm very sure that uh, most of the other um, panelists will be able to follow that and, and answer you as time goes by. Unless if there is anything else, I want to close this webinar. Thank you all very much. 
I'm normally a very uh, critical timekeeper. I'm one minute off. So I want to say thank you all. And thank you very much for being with us. And I really appreciate the panelists who kept their time and were able to bring us as much as we really wanted to hear. Thank you all very much. And uh, congratulations to everyone. Goodbye and have a good evening. Have a good day. And uh, also um, have a good evening. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. All the best. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>